Hi there and welcome to the next episode of our Live Music and Me uh, video shorts where we talk to some special guests about their memories and experiences of their live music gigs. Today's guest is uh, singer-songwriter and musician Louise Quinn. Hope you'll enjoy it. Stay safe. Okay Louise, are you ready for this? Yeah. Cool. Live Music and Me, let's go. So, uh, the first gig you went to? The Stranglers, um, it was the Always the Sun tour. Um, yeah, it was probably mid eighties, I think. Okay. At the Barrowlands, and yeah, it was just absolutely amazing. I mean, I've got two older brothers, one who's ten years older, um, and the other one's five years older. So they were like, you know, big punk fans. Yeah. Um. So so they took me along. I was maybe only about like thirteen. Or wow. 14. Uh, I was a goth at that time. I just remember getting dressed up with my friend Angela and spending hours like back combing hair and dimping it and putting loads of eyeliner on. Yeah. Um, and then just like being totally blown away by the gag. You know, I think we were both in love with um, Jean Jacques Burnell, you know, and uh, we used to try and copy his dance that he did with his bass. And, yeah. And yeah, I mean, I just remember just uh, just being so like overwhelmed by this just incredible experience. And then it was amazing years later when I met Hugh, um, mm-hmm. cause I'd been playing at the Arches doing this sort of gig theater show called Biding Time Remix. And uh, Hugh was playing next door in the Arch next door. Right. Um, and I met him and we started like sort of emailing each other and I sent him some of the videos that I made with the uh, Houston Murray and he was just like wow these are amazing and I was like wow that's Hugh Cornwell and he's like <laughs> <laughs> that he loves these videos and um, so yeah I never would have guessed that would have happened like when yeah. I was you know at that first gig but yeah, it was pretty immense. Great first gig. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Um, the last gig that you went to. Does a carol concert count? <laughs> it does. Yeah. <laughs> In that case, um, yeah, I went to the the carols at Glasgow Cathedral. Okay. Um, yeah, just just before Christmas, um, and that was really beautiful, actually. Um, it was just like all, I think it was like seven lessons or something like that, but mm-hmm. it was quite good because they kept that bit brief and so there was more music and songs uh, and more carols, but that was absolutely beautiful. Um, I mean, I was trying to think of like a sort of gig, gig that I'd been to before yeah. that and it probably would have been like 2016 or something. I mean, okay. A while ago then. That, yeah. Yeah. You um, you've been busy, right? So yeah. yeah. Um. So that would have been like uh, the Jason Mary chain. Mm. Yeah, I think I was at that as well. It's a cracking gig. Okay. A uh, gig that most surprised you, good or bad? Um. I think it was Nancy Sinatra at the the Liquid Rooms. Um. Gosh, when was that? Was that about two thousand and seven or something? I can't remember. Just like, yeah, I think it was about then, but, um, you know, I was just wondering what she was going to be like, because, you know, obviously you've got this idea of like Nancy, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when she's younger and stuff, but uh, I thought she was absolutely amazing, you know, she just totally went for it. She had like, you know, thigh high boots on and everything and um, our band, I think it was like all pretty kind of... Uh, well-known musicians um, who were playing with her and yeah she was kind of rocking out a wee bit more I mean I think like some of the reviews were quite scathing just sort of saying that the band were sort of drowning her out but um, I think she just hit some amazing high points when she did like these boots are made for walking. Mm. Um, Did she do any of the Lee Hazelwood stuff? Sorry? Did she do any of the Lee Hazelwood um, Yeah, I can't can't remember. Sunday morning, stuff like that. 
she may be dead. I mm. remember uh, you only left twice. She did mm. that. Yeah. That um, but uh, yeah, I mean, she was just such a big influence on what I was doing at the time as yeah. well, you know. Um, yeah, I can see that. And yeah. yeah. And she's iconic, right? So. Oh, she's amazing. Yeah. yeah doesn't Legend. Matter, doesn't matter what age she is. She's just yeah. like. She's Nancy Sinatra. So. Indeed, absolutely. Okay, <laughs> um, first gig you went to with a partner? Um, well, try to remember this. I think it was actually the Reading Festival. Um, so I was still at school, I was at secondary school. Um, it was my first boyfriend. And yeah, we went to the Reading Festival. So the first band we would have saw would have been, um, I'm pretty sure it was Gay Bikers on Acid. Okay. Uh, you remember yeah. that? What yeah. gives you the idea? <laughs> so uh, very um, good. Yeah, and then it was like Pop Loose itself and Sugar Cubes, um, Boys of the Beehive. I remember them being absolutely amazing. Mm. Um, did the Breeders play? I think it was, I'm pretty sure Kim Deal was there in some. It was, would have been the breeders at that time, I think. Yeah. But um, yeah, that was like pretty amazing too. But yeah, I guess it's it's different, isn't it, when you go to a gig with a partner, you know? Yeah. And uh, so yeah, so it was a good a good uh gig or an overall experience. For, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What year would that have been? Roughly. Like it was like. Is that 89 or something? Or? Yeah. Yeah, maybe about that, yeah. Fantastic. Um, a gig that you had a ticket to but missed? Um, well, I don't know if this counts, but I was at that Pixies gig at the SCCC when the right. stage collapsed, so it was like... <laughs> yeah, that counts, yeah. So it was like three songs or something, and, and I think it was like gigantic, and everybody was just like, oh, this is amazing. It's like they're actually there, and there's like um, yep. MDO, and and then the stage collapsed, and it was just like, or like <laughs> the security barrier or something. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and then it was just like so disappointing, and then they didn't play Glasgow again for quite a while, I don't think. but Yeah, yeah, they didn't reschedule, I don't think, that, that gig, did they? No. No, I remember that. No, I had the same thing with Boomtown Rats. I'd never saw the Boomtown Rats, and um, they announced the tour just as um, COVID was happening or about to happen, mm -hmm. and obviously the whole tour got cancelled. And it was the original lineup, um, minus one of them, I think, has passed away. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought I need to go and see that, you know, and uh, got a ticket. And of course, they cancelled the whole tour. And then when they rescheduled, they rescheduled the whole tour apart from Glasgow. Oh, sure, so, sure. so he's all he's off my list now. <laughs> <laughs> um, a bucket gig in the past you wished you'd went to um, I think it would have to be Sarah Vaughan I mean I, I would have loved to have seen Sarah Vaughan um, I mean when I first started singing with uh, the first band I was in Hard Body mm -hmm. um, it was like the people I was in that band with were really into jazz and that's when I started sort of getting into jazz. Uh, I mean, my grandfather had been into like the Ink Spots and Ella Fitzgerald and all that, but I hadn't really sort of paid attention. But, you know, then I started listening to Miles Davis and Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday, Sarah Vaughan. Um, but I remember because uh, Hardbody got signed to Sony after playing just 10 gigs and we were managed by GR Management who's mm -hmm. like Screams manager um, and I just remember there being like loads of like showcases with loads of A&R guys there and I remember one of them coming up to me afterwards and saying you sing like Sarah Vaughan he was like he says I'm not being cheeky he says but See if you got like singing lessons. Yep. <laughs> uh, but I think he was he was saying, you know, he says you you could he says you could be as good as her, or, or he was just sort of saying you've got that same style and that that voice. Um yep. he was saying, I just I think your voice is brilliant, but I think you know you need to develop it. And he was right actually, because um some of the recordings I did with Hard Body, um, you know, I was a bit 
was a bit mannered or something. I mean, actually, it wasn't too far off what Amy Winehouse went on to do. Okay. But back then, it was, like, deeply unfashionable. I mean, we were playing gigs with, like, Sleeper and the Eels, and it was, like, very sort of rap pop. I mean, I suppose you had, like, the Cardigans and stuff like that come out, but um, in space, even, I guess, mm-hmm. or kind of crooners. But, yeah. um, and there was the whole lounge core thing, but um, I remember people saying to me, why do you sing like that? It's so old-fashioned sounding. Well, of course, but, you, always, you always had Bowie doing his crooning, didn't you? Through, yeah. through his whole career, pretty much so. And there's nobody cooler than, than Bowie, so. Yeah. You know? Um, I, 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 I wish I could have seen Sarah Vaughan, because then I just, after he said that, I just listened to, to loads and loads of Sarah Vaughan, and I was just like, yeah. Well, he's right, she's amazing. <laughs> And um, yeah, I just think to be at a gig where she was singing live would have been incredible. Absolutely. Okay. Um, best support act you've ever seen? Tricky. Tricky. When he was supporting PJ Harvey at the Barlands. Um, okay. This has been about in the 90s, early 90s, maybe. That's when PJ Harvey had, um, she'd released To Bring You My Love. Yeah. Um, so she was doing that whole, I mean, I loved it, the big sort of like almost like a drag act, you know, mm. it was very theatricalized compared to, you know, what she'd done before. Um, but Tricky was a support act and, you know, he was just, it was really sort of um, very focused, but just very intense, you know, mm. and, and what he was doing, it was just, you're just like, ah, oh, yeah, just incredible for that time in Barlands as well mm. and when I looked it up um, I actually said that Goldfrap was doing backing vocals for him oh, okay. at that point um, yeah. I, I don't think I noticed her to be mm. honest although loads of people were like yeah Goldfrap's amazing just from her singing with Tricky you know doing mm. backing vocals but I just remember it you know just being a really amazing Gag, yeah. It's not a bad lineup, is it? No. <laughs> bad at all. Okay, um, a gig that made you miss the last bus or train home? Um, well, it would have to probably be like a DJ gig. Um, so sub club, yeah, I used to go to the sub club quite a lot. That's uh, what I blew all my students <laughs> on. Uh, cause, uh, uh. I was studying drama at the conservatoire uh well it was okay. at the royal scottish academy of music and drama at the time and um yeah i used to go to the sub club and uh stacy pullen was djing there uh i just remember it was the first time i heard um he dropped these sounds fall into my mind i don't know if it's called that by the bucketheads you know mm-hmm. um and i just remember uh, just like the crowd going absolutely wild uh, when he dropped this tune. But uh, yeah, I mean, Sub Club back then, it, it really was just like the most amazing thing. Because mm-hmm. I remember, you know, after going to Sub Club for years, uh, going to New York and thinking, right, that's going to be like the Sub Club, but just like times 10. That's, that's what the Sub Club must have been aiming for. And then um, that's actually when I met Tim Shisenti, who's, you know, doing the, he's sort of art director for Gates of Light. Yep. He does all the artwork and he's done like video and stuff. Um, and, you know, we went out to a club with Tim and our friend Mal, who originally came from Glasgow. I think he came from Castle Milk or something, but he ended up like blacking his way into you know, the film industry in New York. Yeah. Uh, and that's how we met Tim, because Tim's from Brooklyn. But I remember going to a club in New York with them, and I was just like, this is rubbish compared to <laughs> So disappointed. I was just like, it's like Ferris Bueller's Day Off. It was like, rough dress, like um, it was the okay. 80s, and they were just like dancing, like it wasn't cool at all. Mm. You know, it was just like... um. It's probably quite cool because it was so uncool. Maybe I was in the wrong club. I don't know, but it wasn't. It wasn't as good as the sub club, which made me just realise 
how amazing, like, you know, Dominic and Harry and that whole scene was yeah. and how lucky I was to be part of it, you know. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So Glasgow's officially better than New York, yeah? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, here, here. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, a bucket gig that you're still hoping to go to? Uh, Joni Mitchell. Yeah, I mean, I, I just would absolutely love to to go and see Joni Mitchell. I just remember my brother had a C90 tape, a mixed tape of... Um, you know, just fairy stuff that his girlfriend had made them and that was the first time she'd put like a few tracks from Blue on it. Um mm-hmm. I heard that when I was like about fourteen. And I was just like, Who is this? This is absolutely amazing, you know. Um yeah, just it just fitted in with how I was feeling at that time, you know, sort of mm-hmm. being fourteen and living in East School Bride and dressing like a goth and you know, getting my hair cut and dyed like Nico, learning yep. Nico songs on the guitar. It's just like, and then, you know, somebody introduced me to Joni Mitchell. I was just like, yeah, incredible. But then when you start like going into Court and Spark and, yeah. you know, all these incredible albums. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just what an absolute, yeah. She, she's just a, a, a total master, isn't she? Well, she, she turned up last year, didn't she, and played? So um, mm-hmm. that was first time for a long time. So you, you never know. She might end up um, doing some one-offs. Yeah, I don't think yeah. I could afford the ticket. <laughs> she might play the Baris. You, you, you never know, do you? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so, for support. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so what else we got? Uh, gig that you've tra- sorry, gig you travelled the furthest to, to, go, to get to? The the furthest to to get to um I think uh, probably well that I was playing myself or something. No, else. Uh, to see someone else. To, to see someone else, um, not that far really. Uh, I suppose that like those bands that I saw when I was playing festivals myself, you know, like uh. When I played Refract in Serbia, I saw John Spencer Blues Explosion. Okay. Um, and, and they were absolutely incredible. I actually saw when I went to New Orleans, uh, when I was signed to Sony, I saw Ash. They were brilliant. Yeah. And House of uh House of Blues there. Yeah. Um and yeah, it was just such an amazing venue. Um so this was before this is sort of pre Katrina. Right. Um, but I, I remember just being blown away by seeing Ash and, and this really yeah. quite intimate venue, you know. Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd probably say that was, that's the further stuff traveled to. Yeah, it's a fair distance. Um, band or artist that you have saw the most? I think it would have to be the Pastels, actually. Pastels? Uh, yeah. Um, first time I saw them. I was like probably about 15 and it was at uh, Strathclyde Uni. Strathclyde Uni used to be brilliant. You know, mm-hmm. it had all the different floors and mm-hmm. different types of music and great bands. I mean, I, I saw uh, Goodbye Mr. McKenzie there as well and uh, in Spiral Carpets. But yeah, I remember seeing the parcels and I just bought uh, the vinyl of uh, Up For A Bit with the pastels. Right. And uh, yeah, I was playing that a lot, and uh, I remember just having a bit of a crush on Stephen. <laughs> I like his haircut. I told Stephen that years later, and I think he was just like, "What?" <laughs> just, <laughs> I'm <embarrassed>. Yeah. <laughs> I said, like, "Don't worry, I don't feel like that anymore." It's okay. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, but I suppose he's always he's got a painting up in his attic, hasn't he, Stephen? Which is yeah. Just, um, Aging hideously while he's still looking like fifteen. <laughs> he's uh, he's a cool guy for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I saw them then. That was the first time I saw them. And then, yeah, uh, my ex partner worked with them a lot, uh, recording with them a lot. So you know we used to go and see them. And yeah, we ended up doing like a film. We did like a couple of tracks on a film soundtrack. With- okay. Uh, Stephen and Katrina 
and uh, it was through Stephen and Katrina that we started working with Kid Loco because okay. cause Katrina sang on A Grand Love Story and uh, Bal and me were really into uh, the, you know, the Kid Loco um, album that was out at that time, which was A Grand Love Story. And uh, we just sent him a, a tape. It was like Stephen and Katrina gave us his, his address and we just sent him like a tape. I just sat, uh, recorded some songs on a cassette. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, I want to to work with you. So, yeah, he came over to, to Glasgow and uh, he produced our album Lus uh, for the price of a bag of weed and a... <laughs> I, was, I was really difficult to get the weed. Yeah. There was like a, 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 a drought on it. I mean, there was a drought on at the time, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, the, yeah, the stuff we managed to get was apparently really good. I, I don't know, yeah. Myself, but, um, yeah, you should, just, just, you should have taken them to the Blue Lagoon or something and got them some <laughs> <laughs> classic Glasgow. I, I don't know yeah. these things. I mean, it was someone else that got yeah. it, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so pastels. Three, pastels, yeah, and then I saw them play with tennis courts who were, who were amazing. Um, yeah, and Douglas, same um, reference tennis courts and his um, Q and A yeah, favorite life yeah. band. So, uh, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Bow recorded them. Um, yeah, it's an amazing album. Yeah, yeah no, really good. Um, your best favorite gig as a performer? As a performer, well, it actually kind of falls on from that because the album that Kid Loco produced. There was a track which was ten minutes long called "The World Is Upside Down," and you know when. Kid Loco was here, the album was sounding great, but then he took away and he mixed it. And I think he just got too stoned because it just sounded like <laughs> stoned. <laughs> and, uh, so, so we ended up releasing it ourselves. I mean, I, I, a lot of people still say to me, oh, it's a great album. But yeah, we just stuck. It was the early days of like the internet, you know, and we were just, um, we just stuck some tracks up on our website and then we got this email saying um this track that we'd stuck up which the one that was 10 minutes long it was number eight in the serbian charts okay and um and the discomer chart and we're like yeah who which one of our friends has done this <laughs> like, yeah. but then we looked into it and it was true and they were like do you want to come over and play refract festival and so for some reason we thought why don't we drive there? <laughs> so we to Serbia. To Serbia. Okay. <laughs> and we'll make a documentary about it. And uh, so we made a documentary. I mean, God rest um, is so Ali Saunderson. He he was um, the documentary filmmaker, and uh, his friend Derek Ears. They came and made the, the documentary film. It, it's interesting. <laughs> it's not. Brilliant. What's it called? It's called The World is Upside Down. I mean, okay. I, they should put up on, it probably is up on YouTube somewhere. But okay. um, I mean, for that. And it was an incredible experience. So we, we drove through like eight countries mm. and we took the ferry and eventually got there. And, and you know, I mean, it's just been through like five wars mm. uh, and, you know, the Milosevic regime. Mm. Um, but it was the station... Um, that had sort of helped bring down uh, the Milosevic regime that was, was playing the track out. Okay. Um, this guy who's known as like the Serbian John Peel. Um, so he played the track out and yeah. I mean, he, he's the guy that the KLF went over to see. Um, oh, yeah, they recorded with him as well for the, you know, the Help charity album. Oh, wow. In the mid 90s. Yeah. Um, same story, really. And um, uh, yeah, they gave him a lot of PR and uh, they they sampled in quite a few of the things that he would say on his, his shows and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, no, no he's great. Yeah. He was absolutely amazing. But so they, they had us playing in this place, Prietolje, which was down by the borders. Mm-hmm. And um, it was this old kind of communist youth centre. I mean, there was like a big massive drop down to some like running water <laughs> behind the stage. It was quite precarious, but we were the first band to have played live there in five years. I mean, they had loads mm. of rave nights and clubs mm. and all that, 
but no live gigs and the first band ever from outside Serbia to play there. So it really was, it felt like we were the Beatles basically. Yeah. I mean, we Very got special. Like 10 encores and we were getting and had to like run away basically, yeah. to escape the crowd. Like they're all like rocking the van and yeah. they put us up in like this wee kind of log cabin place up in the mountains and have you been um, back again to play? No, um, I mean I'd love to, but it's like put you it talk on your bucket people, list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a, a lot of people. Well, when you talk to like funding bodies, of like, oh, there's no money in that region, but the people were so beautiful and mm. kind, and just you know they were just amazing, and they just really appreciated that we'd went over there and just yeah, played. a bit. And made them feel a bit normal after everything they've been through. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Quite special. Okay, uh, just a couple more. Uh, so, favourite live music venue? Um, I think it'll probably have to be King Tuts, actually. Um, yeah, just played there so much. Um, you know, when we were managed by Rab and Jerry, they had a good friendship with Jeff. And I just remember sort of playing some brilliant gigs with like Nectarine number nine and Biss mm. Mm. And, uh you know a lot of bands that were around at that time and and just yeah just it, it being like a good a good time a lot of good memories okay um, uh yeah perfect um best ever gig best ever gig um that I've seen that you've saw <laughs> yeah um Lou Reed at Glastonbury. Um, gosh, I can't remember when that would have been, late 80s, 90s. Uh, but I just remember it was when Glastonbury wasn't totally massive um, and you could still sit on the hill and watch yeah. the pyramid stage. And I just remember Lou Reed like, playing Straw Man <laughs> and the, the sun setting and it just being, yeah, just absolutely amazing. Yeah. Just, that's, that's perfect. That is yeah. Lurie indeed. And your last one is uh, one live album that everyone should own. Um, see, I mean, I have never had much vinyl. It's always belonged to someone else. Like, <laughs> like my brother's vinyl collection yeah. or my ex's like vinyl collection. I think when I was 15, I was probably quite well off because I was doing a paper run and a coupon run. Yep living at home so I could actually afford to buy some vinyl but I never bought any live uh, albums myself but my brothers had the Secret Policeman's Ball okay. albums yeah, yeah. and I remember just listening to the one that had like Tom Waits sing and not Tom Waits I'm talking about Tom Robinson <laughs> um, you know sing If You're Glad To Be Gay yeah on it um and you know just it had bits of wee bits of comedy live comedy and stuff on it too on some of them but i just remember thinking that that was like those albums were great you know mm. yeah, um, yeah. and you know there is i think there is quite a lot of money for uh amnesty international as well yeah. uh, and they were kind of ahead of their time a little bit weren't they you, you know quite eclectic and um they covered a lot of genres and it's quite quite challenging in its own way to to kind of go along or listen to rather than just rocking up and seeing one artist for two yeah, hours or whatever you know so. on that uh, right. album as well um, yeah. kate bush maybe I'm sure they got kate bush to play one of them which was really unusual at the time uh, I know, still, it was still is I, yeah i mean that's just like them and like an acoustic guitar yeah uh, playing some really big songs but i think like that made me go and uh, check out like Tommy and some mm. of the Who stuff from hearing that but um, yeah it was brilliant to to hear I was just really taken by Tom Robinson actually and um, so that was great when Tom started playing my songs on the and he would yeah. and Tom and music. Him, yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah. saying you know your voice is great and stuff so Good. that was brilliant yeah. excellent nice way to finish Lovely. Louise Quinn, thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. Thanks.